Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining. Please just give us a couple more minutes while we wait for a few more people and then we'll start. Thank you for your patience. And in the meantime, hosts, if you can turn on your videos. Thank you. You're muted, Kate. <laughs> Thank you, Manana. Rookie mistake. Thank you to everyone who joined us this morning. We know it's been really short notice and there's a lot going on, so we appreciate you making the time. So as many of you will know, um, eight months ago in October, South Africa and India made a proposal before the World Trade Organization to temporarily waive intellectual property on life-saving life COVID-19 medical tools. Then on Wednesday night, South Africa time, the United States came out and said that they would be supporting um, the waiver as well, which was obviously a big deal. And that's why we're here today to discuss it. So um, I'm gonna be introducing my panel who will be making opening comments and then we'll open up the floor to questions. So first of all, we have um, Fatima Hassan, the director of the Health Justice Initiatives. Um, then we have Yuan Kiong Hu, who's the policy coordinator with the MSF Access Campaign. And finally, we have Umanyana Rujeje, who is the executive director of Section 27. So all of them are lawyers, and I'm very pleased that we have an all-woman panel. Uh, my name is Kate Stegerman. I'm the advocacy coordinator for the MSF Access Campaign here in Southern Africa. Okay, so I think to kick us off, Fatima, if you could just start with some opening remarks, please. Thank you, Kate, and thank you everybody for joining this webinar. Uh, so I just wanted to make a few points before handing over to Yuan and to Umanyana. The first is that we're in a crisis. I mean, you know, over 3 million people have died and infections are increasing around the world. And I think the situation in India and Nepal and Sri Lanka is obviously cause for concern. So the momentum that needs to be built in the next few weeks and months is, is basically the difference between life and death for many people in the global south. Um, the, the second thing I wanted to say is that obviously where we welcome the Biden administration's announcement and really it's, he's giving effect partially to a promise he made when he was campaigning to be the president of the United States. So even though it's eight months too late, we still do welcome it. It, it is a small step uh, to be able to go forward uh, in terms of the TRIPS waiver, but also in terms of other initiatives to scale up manufacturing, not just in Africa, but in parts of the global south, particularly in Latin America and Asia as well. And maybe this actually, the statement from the US Trade uh, Office is actually uh, the first of a long journey where over the next few decades, we'll finally be able to have a real reckoning around the impact of intellectual property on access to healthcare services, in particular medicines. The fact that medicines are still commodified, that they are subject to a trade regime and subject to the you know, quite excessive and quite uh, protectionist rules of the World Trade Organization is a key concern for many organizations and many health access advocates uh, and activists. We've seen in the last 48 hours that once the US made its announcement that there's going to be a likely impact on whether the countries that continue to oppose the, the, the waiver, uh, and that's the entire EU, 
you've got Australia, you've got uh, Canada, you've got Switzerland, you've got Norway, you've got Japan, you've got Brazil. So a number of countries that have already started vaccinating their populations that have over-ordered a lot of doses that are also drawing on supplies from COVAX, which is meant to be supporting low and middle income countries, are actually ironically blocking the waiver and the ability of people in low income parts of the world to access vaccines. And you've seen the stats this week, 0.2% of vaccine supplies uh, have actually been administered in the global south and most of the vaccine supplies about 80 percent have already been vaccinated uh, have already been given to people as part of vaccination programs in the global north um, the eu there's some preliminary indications that they may be willing to have further conversations and we do expect that there'll be a split within eu member states and surprisingly we've seen the german government actually come out quite strongly in favor of intellectual property and patent protections uh, and that may have something to do with the pfizer bio situation, but we can discuss that in the Q&A. We're seeing some U-turns from other leading foundations as well. We just saw a statement from the Gates Foundation yesterday. So I think that we shouldn't underestimate the statement and the move by the US government. It's certainly going to create a, a ripple effect. Um, what do we need now? We obviously need transparent negotiations. We've learned uh, from past lessons, particularly around how um, the Doha Declaration was negotiated. We can't basically wait for months for this waiver to be finalized and for the text to be finalized. It needs to be transparent. Civil society needs to have a seat at the table. You can't defer only to pharmaceutical interests and to vested interests and to, you know, well-funded lobbies in the negotiations. Uh, and also it can't be watered down. The statement is very narrow by the US government. It only relates to vaccines. The waiver proposal was much broader in a sense. It asked for all COVID-19 related technologies. The situation around access to testing, diagnostic kits, ventilators, oxygen, treatment, uh, potentially even remdesivir means that the waiver can't actually just be narrowed down to vaccines. And so that is a key uh, concern for us. Uh, I'd like to just in closing acknowledge actually the South African government and the Indian government. I don't think we've given them enough credit in this entire saga. They've been negotiating uh, in the beginning alone uh, for almost eight months, they've had a lot of diplomatic um, opposition. They've had a lot of opposition from the wealthier countries that have been opposing the waiver, and they've been steadfast in making sure that the waiver is actually uh, becomes a central issue that needs to be discussed at the WTO, and have been pushing that in. So our negotiating teams, I think, really uh, deserve a lot of credit uh, from civil society and from the media in South Africa. It's unfortunate that the government has not briefed us enough about it. The president took very long to actually talk about the TRIPS waiver and the implications of, of asking for that uh, and, and, and the proposal being led by the South African and Indian government. But be that as it may, we, we now are at this particular uh, moment in time, which I think is quite significant as a health activist in the space for over 20 years. This, this is something quite remarkable, the speed at which we've been able to actually uh, get the US government to pause correct. Um, so yeah, in closing, what we now need, tech transfer, the sharing of knowledge and the sharing of the vaccine know-how, because we all know that the wave is just one part of a bigger puzzle. Uh, which basically needs to be addressed collectively and jointly so that we can actually scale up uh, production and manufacturing for the global south. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Fatima. Um, and over and above giving credit to uh, negotiators from South Africa and India, um, I think a lot of you here will agree as well that what we've seen happen in the last few days is also a huge testament to incredible advocacy efforts from civil society organizations. So, of course, from Doctors Without Borders, Section 27 Health Justice Initiative, the People's um, Vaccine Coalition have really pushed hard. So an incredible effort. Um, and I think for, for some of you, you know, remembering back to what we dealt with the HIV crisis, it's really fantastic to see this kind of momentum um, happening again for such a big public health crisis. Um, so over to you, please, Yuan. Um, please, just to reflect a little on, on what some of MSF's opening statements are with regards to the news that happened on Wednesday night. And perhaps you could give us a little bit of insight as well into what we can expect uh, to happen in the coming weeks at the WTO. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, also, um, uh, echo what Kay said. Um, what we 
are uh, hear, hearing and seeing now in the past few days is really a result of the global effort from civil societies and South African negotiators, Indian negotiators, many institutions um, and advocates uh, help. So it, it, for, from MSS side, it's, um, we, we take this move from the US quite uh, positively uh, because we, we know uh, historically, normally US um, would normally be the last country who, who is blocking everybody else. But then um, the dynamic now is very interesting to observe, especially this, uh, the, this announcement um, was made very shortly after the USTR uh, new Special 301 report this year, um, launched without any attack on uh, compost license. Uh, so we thought it, it shows probably two things. One is uh, activism uh, can really push the boundary and open the space for public health safeguarding. And, and secondly, uh, there are probably uh, really some, some discussion going on in, in White House with uh, new administration. Uh, they probably want to do something different. But um, as we know, it's always tricky to, when it's come to US politics, uh, we still need to wait and see what would be uh, uh, played out in the coming uh, weeks and months when it's come to the concrete actions. But in, uh, in any uh, case, uh, politically, this, this is a really dramatic and uh, significant moment uh, for this movement. Um, so when it comes to uh, maybe two, two things for us for, for, for now to, to take note from our, our perspective, one is uh, what the what, uh, US is saying when we read the details of the, the statement and what the other, for, for instance, uh, Fatima mentioned, uh, countries started having positive reaction, but also some country started having negative reactions, such as we know Germany, uh, Merkel already said um, she's not following, and Switzerland said they are not following, uh, but other country uh, more or less either already said positive message or show some willingness to open up for negotiation. Um, but if we look at what the U.S. statement is exactly saying, um, it, we, sh we, we, we see that as some details, devils are still in the detail for us to keep observing. The, they only mentioned the vaccine, so they only mentioned vaccine, which is very different from what South Africa and India uh, are proposing and agreed by 100 countries uh, to, to, to actually cover um, diagnostic, therapeutics, uh, technologies and materials. So everything needed to, to uh, ensure supply and production should be covered because we're in an emergency. So to what extent that was the choice of only talk about vaccine was a tactical one or a practical one, we, are, we still don't know yet. So we will see how US would uh, do uh, in the following um, WTO process. Uh, so whether, because sometimes we know a lot of the public media only talk about vaccine when it's talk about waiver, we always said that, you know, it, it's not correct. You should talk about everything, right? But then it's a choice because vaccine is probably the most, uh, it's a hot topic. So, so we don't know whether it is, again, whether it's a tactic choice for USTR to only focus on vaccine or they have made this choice, they only support uh, waiver on vaccine. So we still need to watch what's gonna happen. And the secondly is that um, they clearly say they are ready to engage tax-based negotiation, which is uh, also a very um, good sign because we have been also uh, asking and uh, advocating, especially uh, among the opposing countries to see, okay, at least you don't stand in a way for other countries to start tax-based negotiation. And then the tax-based negotiation request has been uh, increasing also in Geneva. What we heard in general council, uh, a lot of people also, um, also uh, a lot of countries also ask for tax-based negotiation among these 100 supporters. But then we also know technically when the, if a country really start tech-based negotiation, it, it, it will be a new stage of the battle and fight when they really look at the, the language. Um, we do have a lot of senior advocates in the movement who um, had to experience how, for instance, Doha negotiation was done and how you know the Doha declaration 
was paragraph six was kind of compromised and then watered down in the follow on uh, negotiation uh, kind of implementation uh, and, and resulted in the article 31 bit, which was totally useless. So um, similar thing could happen because the pharma will not give up. If people really start negotiation, we will probably face another level of battle uh, over there. So the uh, last bit was also um, one of my colleagues flagged to me um, and this morning, actually, if we look at also how media reports about this issue, and so probably also how people talk to media about that, some of the media start saying, oh, now the country started following the US initiative on waiving the patent. And we said, okay, that's wrong. <laughs> this is not US, it's a developing country initiative, right? it's a South African initiative, it is an Indian initiative. 100 countries and 61 of them already officially sponsored. They already got it since last year. And it's a seven, seven months that has been wasted because of this small group of country who, who don't get it or who choose to uh, bond over pharma pressure other than uh, do something different. So those kind of narrative probably will keep coming in. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know, from a narrative and framing perspective, we probably just need to keep reminding people it's not US initiative. It, it is a South African Indian initiative. It's a developing country's request. Um, so that is, I mean, three very quick observations uh, in the past two days um, we, we are having. Uh, and then there's also a rumor, which is not yet verified, that US is probably drafting something, but we know South Africa and India already worked uh, on the revision text. It's just they haven't presented it. What we heard uh, was that um, last week in the, in the Trips Council formal session, again, there's a lot of circular discussion. I mean, uh, and in the general council uh, this week, I think the last two days, um, there was no decision also, but it's it, it clearly noted by the chair reporting what's happening in Trips Council is that the proponent uh, led by the South Africa and India are, are uh, planning to present the revision tax somewhere in, in May. So somewhere either around or after mid of May. Um, but um, for the moment, there's two variants. We don't know whether the sudden uh, change of position by US would uh, accelerate that process of presenting the revision tax uh, or not. And then secondly, how much that would um, change the schedule of the informal meeting, because normally uh, we know now uh, already people, they will hold uh, informal discussions, bilateral negotiations, until the Trips Council meet again for the formal session will be only in June, which is again quite late. So in May, it's probably very critical to, to um, for us to clarify and also to understand a bit more how this dynamic now happening um, in the public space would impact the Geneva process. Yeah, so I will stop here and then we... Just before we move on to Umanyana, um, perhaps Yuan, if you could just give a quick description exactly on what we mean by text-based negotiations for people who aren't familiar with the WTO process and perhaps also reflect just briefly on um, why they seek consensus as well in, the, in those negotiations. Okay, thanks. So uh, tax based negotiation. So um, I mean, to simply in a simplified term, um, for instance, South Africa have you know in India have this piece of proposal, and now the opposing country basically don't talk about what has been written, but more talk about you know, we have a COVAX, don't worry, IP is very important. We should work with the company, we should use a voluntary license. They don't talk about what has been written in by South Africa India, because that is the, the, the foundation of a piece of law, because we are actually proposing a legal instrument under the WTO uh, framework. So the tax-based negotiation would envisage a process that's uh, countries should stop talking about COVAX because it's not the business of, of WTO. They should stop talking about how important IP is, but talk about what has been presented and say, okay, I agree with this paragraph. Maybe we need to replace this word with another word and we, we can negotiate the duration, how many years, how to determine the end of pandemic 
they should come to these practical terms when normally the legal process would uh, envisage. Uh, and then once they have uh, a draft that commented by people and the building up the agreement, um, and then the uh, yeah the consensus would uh, con would be deemed as uh, be achieved. But then the tr one tricky part of the WTO process is that uh, as Kay mentioned. They work on consensus as in most of the cases, meaning that uh, everybody needs to agree, or at least nobody said no. Uh, people can uh, abstand, but uh, nobody should be saying no in order to have a decision. And for the waiver matter, as we know before, that could be a potentially hypothetical uh, situation of voting, but then um, the vote has to be. Uh, three fourths majority, but this voting uh, was only used once in the WTO history in the case that a consensus was already be achieved. So for, for this uh, particular uh, waiver, we, we still don't know uh, from our understanding, the proponents and others and the, the sponsors are not ready to test the voting system yet, meaning that this is still need to be nobody say no. This is scenario. So the negotiation, even if start, will still be a, a quite uh, heavy uh, process. Thank you very much, Yuan, for your insights. Um, so over to Umanyana from Section Twenty Seven for her opening comments. Thank you so much, Kate, and thanks to Yuan and Fatima for those opening remarks. I think what I will focus on then is. Um, to talk more about the domestic uh, legal framework, um, to connect that to what is happening internationally at the World Trade Organization level. Um, so in South Africa, we have a Patents Act that governs um, all patents in the country. We comply with the WTO rule that we must give out 20-year monopolies um, to any pharmaceutical company that applies for it in South Africa. And so we have a, a system that actually does not take advantage of the what we call the TRIPS flexibility. So um, what the, the TRIPS says is that firstly, we must, we must comply with the 20 year monopoly, but it also gives different kinds of flexibilities. For example, a compulsory license can be issued um, if, the, if uh, a company is not exploiting its patent in the country. Um, or if there's a public health emergency, the government can actually um, get a government use license to ensure that we're able to access uh, generic versions of, um, of that medicine. Um, so what, we're in a position where we have a 1970s Patents Act that never changed post the Doha Declaration, which uh, passed at the WTO in 2011. And that declaration was at the WTO level, at government level to say, we agree that there is an impact on public health. These patents do impact on public health and every government is entitled to do what it needs to do at its own uh, country level to ensure access to medicines, to protect public health. Um, so even post that big agreement, which came on the back of the big court case where all the pharmaceutical companies sued the South African government um, at the time of Nelson Mandela. Um, and so Do the Doha Declaration actually came out of the, the big push to push back against Big Pharma. Um, they were concerned about being able to um, access markets in Africa. And so they pushed back very hard on our government when our government tried to use these kinds of flexibilities to say we want to be able to parallel import um, cheaper drugs from other countries, even where there is a patent in South Africa. Um, so essentially what we've been arguing for since you know, 2011, our campaign started in 2011, the Fix the Patent Laws campaign, um, is that we need to update those laws. And we've been negotiating with the government and, and uh, the pharmaceutical industry. There have been many versions of the policy document um, that is now in place since 2018, but it, it took many, many versions, many, many meetings, many commitments that were never met. 
Um, and so with the push of civil society, we actually have a 2018 policy that begins to think about how to balance public health and patent protections. Um, that policy talks about the constitution um, and says that indeed the government has an obligation in terms of section 27 of the constitution to put in place legislation that advances the right to healthcare services. And there's a clear recognition that the current patent act and the system of the patent regime um, is not in line with section 27 of the constitution. So there's a lot of work to be done. And last year, you know, early in the pandemic, what we did was to call for a number of things. The first thing was a moratorium on any new patents on COVID related technologies. So that's before we even had vaccines, before we, we knew what treatments were going to work. We said, let's make sure that we're not giving out new patents on these technologies. The second thing what we demanded was for automatic compulsory licenses, where there are um, health technologies that are found to be effective against COVID, but that have patents. And thirdly, we demanded the urgent finalization of um, the amendments to the Patents Act and related legislation. So we think that that is critically important as much as we talk about um, we need vaccines and we need to have a health system that responds um, to the public health crisis, we also need to ensure that the legal framework, um, even as we talk about uh, the, the waiver, um, we need to ensure that our legal framework is at least responsive to the constitution, um, advances the right to healthcare services, and is able to do the necessary once there is a waiver, there's work that has to be done in every jurisdiction to implement that waiver. So there's a need for us to move forward quickly, we think. Um, and we know, we the intel that we have is that the draft amendments to the Patents Act um, have been done. So the work has been done, the technical work has been done, the consultations have been done at a technical level. And what is what is uh, stopping the publication is basically political will. Um, so I would encourage the journalists on the call to, in addition to talking about the TRIPS waiver, to ask questions of the Minister of Trade and Industry why there's been a delay in the publication of the draft uh, legislation um, and when in fact it will be published for public comment. And once it's published for public comment, um, you know, we always get short, uh, short notice for making submissions. We can make those submissions. Um, there are many people outside of South Africa that have been involved in uh, the process of building out the policy and will also have some international solidarity to be able to ensure that the, the draft laws um, actually also respond to public health needs. Um, and I think in the context of the current pandemic, we need to ensure that we are prepared for the worst case scenario. And this is the worst case scenario. So this is a, a perfect opportunity for us to conclude that lawmaking process. I'll stop there, Kate. Thank you, Amanyana. So if there are journalists who have questions, please can you raise your hands? And while I wait for some of you to warm up and think about uh, what you want to ask, um, I'll perhaps ask the panelists one or two questions myself. So uh, Yuan, Umanyana was referring to compulsory licenses um, in her discussion just now. Um, could you perhaps explain why existing TRIPS flexibilities and compulsory licenses in particular are complicated and why the existing system is not necessarily going to be able to fast track, uh, for example, if we're doing it by patent by patent for each vaccine or each or each therapeutic and what some of the challenges are, please. Thanks, uh, thanks, Kate, and uh, thanks, uh, Rena. I and mean, first, I totally agree with what Rena says on the domestic level of uh, using this opportunity to also open space and accelerate the use of flexibility. But when it's come to commerce license. Um, we, we uh, from from our observation, exactly. I mean, before before 
before we got the waiver, right? Hopefully we got waiver. Before you got waiver, composer license is still the most concrete and the most powerful tool, actually, if we government want to get rid of um, some barrier. The limitation is that in, for the moment, uh, in majority of the cases, and even under the um, chips regime, composer license is um, are mostly useful for patents. But um, when it's come to other uh, IP, for instance, um, data exclusivity, if some country have data exclusivity or uh, related to undisclosed in information, when uh, then commercial license is, is less clear in, in national law, when especially some country, if they introduce uh, data exclusivity, they sometimes don't include flexibility to say, okay, when you issue commercial license, that would automatically gone. Uh, so it, it's a little bit uh, tricky in that sense. Uh, but also, there's a really long, um, long time of political pressure, especially from US and EU, as we know, uh, continuously discourage developing country whenever they use commerce license, when they, whenever they discuss about commerce license. That is making it interesting to see the USTR special survey on report this year and the EU enforcement report this year, both stopped mentioning compulsory license as a negative practice. What we don't know is that whether this is, I mean, it shows the pressure works, but what also what we don't know is that whether they did this as a tactic in responding to the pressure only for this year, or they all will continue stop attacking country in the future. But at the same time, they still uh, criticize other issues on IP. So that is pre pre uh, political pressure is one part of the reason. But uh, uh, practically we already, uh, we are saying like actually there's two example now showing the limitation of, um, of the um, uh, only using compost license. One is related to Canada. There's a, a Canadian company as we know the Canadian vaccine company um, who who was uh, who, who didn't get a kind of voluntary license from Johnson Johnson, who said I can produce and I can export, but Johnson Johnson like refused me after I offered all of the terms. And then they were trying to ask for a commercial license from Canadian government, allow them to export, meaning that they, they have to use Article 31B, the special compost license mechanism. But it's been two months now since they ask the Canadian government and there's no decision. So, but Canada at the same time claim in Geneva that people should just use that. It only took us uh, two weeks to issue our special council license. So it shows that it's not so easy because Canada, in order to use that, they need to change a lot of national legislation before they grant the compass license to this company. A second example is uh, we know Russia issued a compass license on Remdesivir, allowed generic production. And then recently we also know uh, they got sued by Gilead. Uh, Gilead didn't agree with this compass license, they should the Russian government. So, and then and India is in a very bad situation as we know. So reportedly that uh, the Russian uh, government and the company trying to send some humanitarian aid uh, supply to India, including generic medicine produced under the compost license. But then it was delayed. If we look, it, it, we have no footage, but if we want to link this to the legal uh, side of the issue, it could in, in tell, uh, suggest two things. One, because Russia is under this lawsuit by Gideon on comes license, they could potentially be, uh, uh, become, there could potentially be complication if they use these uh, goods in dispute for uh, humanitarian aid. And secondly, uh, the type of compulsory license used by Russia was Article 31F, uh, which is uh, has to be pre predominantly for domestic use, meaning that if Russia doesn't want to violate TRIPS agreement, they have to justify that exportation for humanitarian aids as after predominant use in Russia. So it's quite complicated for country to quickly react and. Uh, either support their industry to wrap up production or even help other countries with the existing production because they would potentially run into different level of legal risk with the current rule of compulsory license. 
Thank you very much, Yuan. We're very grateful to have three lawyers on the panel to be able to give that kind of uh, technical reflection. So we appreciate that. I have one quick question for you, Fatima, before we go over to the journalist questions. Um, perhaps you wouldn't mind reflecting a little bit on why the Biden-Harris administration has only come out in support of a more narrow focus waiver with particular reference to vaccines. Thanks, Kate. So, I mean, just echoing what Yuan had said and what Jimenyana had said, but, you know, our assessment of what is happening in the Biden administration is that uh, we think there's primarily three reasons why they're only focusing on vaccines. The first is the public health reason, because they realize that the U.S. is not safe epidemiologically if the rest of the world is not safe. And so you've got to vaccinate everybody quite fast because otherwise the global economy can't resuscitate and you'll just have multiple travel bans and you'll just you know, have, a, have a very difficult public health crisis. I think obviously the footage of what was happening in India made it even more difficult for the Biden administration to justify why it was continuing to block the waivers. And so that public health crisis was you know, in the, in, on, on national television, it was all over social media. It's very hard to escape that kind of reality. Um, but I think the second reason is that um, the Biden administration, given what has happened in the US in the last four years under the previous administration, this is an opportunity for them to take the moral high ground. And certainly the way in which, or the shameful way in which the EU and particularly the German government have responded in the last few days indicates that Biden may be winning that particular public image battle. And, and I think that's sort of a, an important political factor in, in the way in which the geopolitics is operating between the EU and the US. Unless, of course, it's more cynical and it was agreed that the US would play good cop and that the EU would play bad cop. And in that way, you water down the waiver. So, you know, we can't, we can't also to discount that. Um, and the third reason, I think, is because you know, there's likely to be lots of incentives for U.S. vaccine manufacturers through this particular waiver negotiations or through the watering down of the initial waiver proposal. And the U.S. sees itself as a leading vaccine manufacturer. I mean, there's already pressure on the U.S. government to invest a lot of money in, you know, creating a um, a global vaccine hub, uh, which would primarily create jobs for, for, for people in the US and it could uh, basically boost the economy. So there are also, I think, other political, economic and public health considerations to why the vaccines are prioritized over, for example, diagnostic kits or, or you know, other forms of treatment. But I think the main one really is that, um, you know, they need the world to be vaccinated so that their own population can basically be safe. Thanks. Thank you very much, Fatima. Okay, just going over now uh, to some questions. So from the chat, um, perhaps Omanyana, you can tackle this one and the other panelists can also jump in if they want to elaborate. So from Barry, given that we already have secured vaccines as South Africa, could a waiver that only concerns vaccines have an impact on SA's rollout? Yeah, I think, you know, we have, we have secured um, vaccines, they haven't arrived. And we do know that because of the situation in India, there's going to that we may be affected in terms of um, the, the the vaccines that we've secured through uh, bilateral agreements, because India is the primary manufacturer of vaccines. So to be honest, until those vaccines land on our shores, and we know that we're getting drips of vaccines, we're getting 300,000 vaccines per week, potentially for the next few weeks. Um, so I think that the, the, the rollout issue in South Africa is that we need to ensure that we are, the government is working with the private sector, with civil society, um, with, organize, with communities across the country um, to be able to reach people, to be able to reach people in rural areas and urban areas around the country. Um, and there is a lot of goodwill in South Africa to assist. So I think that what the government needs to do, in addition to um, getting these deals for vaccines, is to actually work with the populace to ensure that we are quickly able to finish vaccinating healthcare workers, move on to elderly people um, who will need a lot of support to get vaccinated, and then uh, the rest of the population. Thanks. Thanks, Amanyana. Um, please forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name, but Benicius from Globo uh, News TV in Brazil asks, do you think with Brazil 
the cha uh, will change the position and also support the waiver on vaccine patents. Yuan, I'm going to ask you please to answer that one. I know we've recently um, had a bit of insight and developments in Brazil from um, our colleague who works there, Felipe, and perhaps you can reflect a little on that, Yuan. Yeah, th thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, we, we haven't uh, heard uh, Brazil finally change their position, but uh, yeah, definitely they are under a lot of pressure because um, uh, uh, b b because uh, we, we heard there's a huge pressure and also demand from the parliament in, in Brazil and the senators and the parliamentary are really pushing the government to change the position because Brazil used to be a leader um, in, in safeguarding public health and uh, also in a situation that both uh, suffered from the pandemic also have a capacity to produce because Brazil is another country who have a medical capacity and with the knowledge about how you know flexibility and removing IP could really benefit uh, access to medicines. So we hope, uh, you know, the effort from the parliamentary um, members, senators and civil society could uh, generate a uh, positive reaction from Brazil in the Geneva process that Brazil will come back to join the other developing countries and make sure this is it this uh, extraordinary moment um, are delivered that could, Brazil itself can also uh, support, I mean, contribute more in terms of diversifying the supply. Thanks, Yuan. Yes, because for those of you who don't know, um, Brazil has a strong manufacturing um, capacity uh, in country. And also there's been a lot of talk recently about how terrible the situation is um, from a COVID epidemiological point of view in India, but there hasn't been a lot of discussion about how absolutely dire the situation is in Brazil. And I think because we're getting so much information happening from India, perhaps it would be really great to see the press reporting on what's happening elsewhere and how concerning this is in so many other countries. Um, okay, so a question please, perhaps Fatima, you could take this question from Ryan. Um, if this IP waiver went through tomorrow, how quickly would South Africa be able to start producing vaccines? What factors, i.e. tech transfer, does that depend on? Yeah, so, I mean, great question. And lots of people are asking about, well, what happens if the waiver is granted tomorrow and <clears throat> where would the production capacity be? So maybe if I can just answer both those questions together, because there's a question in the chat box about mRNA production capacities. I think the first issue is, you know, as we said in the introduction, that the waiver alone is not going to immediately translate into increased production and capacity. There has to be the explicit cooperation of the pharmaceutical industries or the people that hold the IP, or in some cases, the knowledge. Uh, in order to ensure that there is a transfer of the technology and the transfer of the vaccine know-how. I think the preoccupation with whether South Africa can quickly produce vaccines or whether it's, you know, one country in Africa is, is not very helpful. What we do know, however, uh, is that if you, if you can secure the waiver, it opens the, the way for the negotiations and the discussions around the tech transfer. And there are companies in Africa as well as in Latin America and Asia that have untapped production capacity, it's underutilized production capacity at the moment that could benefit from uh, tech transfer. So there's at least six companies that have been identified in Africa by the Africa CDC. Yes, two, one or two happen to be in South Africa. Um, so, so, so there's that. The WHO mRNA technology hub uh, idea basically where they've asked for expressions of interest had at least 50 applications. So the issue in relation to the waiver and it's why I've mentioned all of these different companies that, that we know potentially could actually scale up production is that if you're not looking over your shoulder if you are not going to be uh, potentially sued for patent infringement or for liability or for copyright infringement, then you would be able to scale up production by having the necessary investment. And the investment can take the form of government incentives to basically incentivize you to retrofit a facility, for example, or it can be in the form of private investments into the actual manufacturing facilities. So there's definitely, we believe as uh, activists and organizations around the world, untapped and underutilized production capacity. And I think that, um, you know, to be frank, it's the speaking points of the pharmaceutical industry to say that nobody 
in the global south can manufacture safe and effective vaccines, that no plants exist, that no capacity exists, that nobody can make safe and quality vaccines. If there's cooperation, the transfer of knowledge and the sharing of the vaccine know-how, it, uh, it definitely is possible. Um, and, and just on that, I mean, you know, the other question we get then is then, well, why don't you just accept voluntary licenses? Well, we've had a year of this pandemic. We've had a handful of voluntary licenses and the voluntary licensees have been cherry picked by the pharmaceutical industry. So they've decided who they want to partner with, who they want to cooperate with. Um, and, and that hand picking process doesn't necessarily also always translate into the most effective sort of quality control uh, measures. I mean, um, even with aspirin, it's only a full and finished license, not even a full manufacturing license. And it just reminds, you know, some of the questions that we're getting from the pharmaceutical industry in the last few days, um, and, and, the, and the speaking points of, of the supporters of that particular kind of approach reminds us of what happened 20 years ago when they said, well, you can't make high quality ARVs, let alone distribute ARVs in your country and in your context. And so some of, some of the, you know, the opposition to trying to scale up production in the global south, I think, is also coming off as, as really paternalistic and in some cases even quite racist, I'm afraid to say. Um, and okay, just my last point on the compulsory licensing, because then people will say, well, why don't you just issue a compulsory license and fix the patent laws? And yes, we must fix the patent laws. And you know, the big question is where has parliament been in this pandemic for the last year? The opposition parties are totally silent about the role of patents in this particular pandemic. I mean, are they doing anything meaningful to actually fast track the passage of this particular bill? If you don't pass it now in this pandemic, I'm not sure when South Africa is ever going to pass the, this bill. But even during apartheid, and even after apartheid, in a democratic South Africa, the constitution, you know, the provisions that Omani and I have spoken about, our government has never in a hundred years issued a compulsory license on a pharmaceutical product. And it's likely never to. We've said that it should, we'll demand that it will. It's likely it never will do because of the pressure and the litigation and the army of lawyers that will come down your back from the pharmaceutical industry if you actually try and do that. Thanks, Kate. Thank you very much, Fatima. Um, so a question from Khadija. The US government financed Pfizer and Moderna's cost of production, so between two and $2.5 billion, using public taxpayer monies. On the news of trial efficacy, the companies cashed in using thinly veiled but technically legal insider trading pre-application by selling, uh, selling stock en masse, Pfizer 60%. Is there a way to hold the companies accountable for strategically exploiting this crisis, perhaps through racketeering, collusion? The process appears to be one of draining development countries' taxpayer budgets as financer of drugs and buyer cash cars or developing countries are collateral damage. I'm going to open that up to any of you to see who might want to answer that one. Don't know if anyone has any strong thoughts. Any strong feelings there from anyone in the panel? I can I can kick off. Uh, no, no, go ahead. I think all of us have some feeling, but uh, I follow you. Too. I always love having Khadija on our webinars because she'll ask us the most the most difficult questions. But uh, I think Khadija's right. I think the it's it's part of the bigger story, right, in this pandemic of the conduct of pharmaceutical companies, particularly Pfizer, Johnson and Johnson, and. Uh, Khadija's right, there's been significant public investment, and particularly by the US government, which I think also goes back to the earlier point of why are they focusing on vaccines, because uh, in the case of Johnson & Johnson and Moderna, the US government is like the most significant contributor to the funding of the R&D. And in the case of Moderna, we argue that the US government even owns the IP. But I think that Khadija, you know, you, what, what is likely to happen is that those are the issues that will be considered in two or three years time when we've actually vaccinated as many people as possible and actually get through this initial part of the uh, initial part of the public health uh, crisis. Um, so Kate, can I just add one thing to the previous question? I think Barry asked about the, uh, or somebody asked about the mRNA production capacity. Uh, just, you know, I'd urge you to follow a lot of the threads and information being issued by Public Citizen and Prep for All. And a lot of significant work is being done by US groups that are putting pressure on the US government, particularly around the mRNA technologies. And that's why we've been also focusing on um, uh, Moderna quite a bit, even though 
South Africa hasn't even been able to secure any supplies of Moderna, and Moderna doesn't even want to come into South Africa, despite you know, pledging a little bit of dosages to, to COVAX, which is not sustainable, is that the, the experts that we are speaking to suggest that for mRNA type technologies, you can scale up and retro, you can scale up production and retrofit uh, manufacturing plants within three to six months. And that type of technology is actually easier to do and easier to replicate. But if you're given the green light and you're given the go ahead and you know there's a waiver and there isn't going to be, uh, you know, the possibility of a patent infringement suit or trade pressure from the US government to the EU, then you would be able to invest in, in, in that kind of facilities. We know that there's, we're not sure because it's not very transparent and, you know, the industry and, and a lot of governments are not really sharing a lot of information, but we hear that after the African Manufacturing Capacity Conference that was held a, a few weeks ago, that there's potentially some conversation between Moderna and the government of Rwanda. And so that, that, that is also something uh, to be looking at. Thank you, Ewan. I think you wanted to chip in there as well. Yeah, maybe quickly on the public funding, uh, taxpayer money, totally agree. Um, and for the moment, I, th I think we're seeing like one of the biggest lessons actually for high income country to learn is they lost all of the opportunity to hold any leverage out of this unprecedented public funding. So for the moment, the, it is reinforced the, how the current system is works, right? So if we see, you know, Moderna vaccine was uh, funded and supported by NIH and uh, and other institutions, Pfizer didn't even develop this vaccine. It is a German scientist, a biotech, developed this vaccine, and a lot of others like AstraZeneca vaccine even has controversy was not developed by AstraZeneca. They they just acquire the IP because they have money. And then when, because they have money and supported by others in this case. So the system is really, uh, broken uh, at the point when the public funding was getting lost in terms of holding company uh, accountable. Um, for, for the moment, I think uh, there should be a lot of reflections um, in, the, in the maybe near, near future if there's a new funding to be generated. Uh, we heard that there's a new effort of asking for more funding, but then um, how you know, more money would fix this, this uh, kiosk uh, I, I'm not quite sure unless uh, we need to rethink about how the how the public funding should be um, uh, tracked and, and accountable and uh, very specific uh, conditions should be attached to those funding. Therefore, um, the, the pharma would not make a hive for their share share price um, in the market. Thanks, you. And I just got a follow-up question related to that for you, Omanyana. There's a lot of discussion as well about public funding, but an area that's slightly less looked at is public participation in clinical trials. And it's something that this isn't just about money. So, for example, in South Africa and Brazil and in various other countries, people participated in those trials. And without, particularly with regards variants, with, without that data, um, those companies would not be able to market those vaccines. And I think that that's also something that's an important to consider. I just wanted to know, um, you know, if you had some reflections on that, Manana, and and also perhaps, you know, how, how that issue can, can be used to counter, you know, some of these arguments that this was, you know, that the vaccine development was specifically um, sort of driven by, by the global north. Well, um, yeah, so in South Africa, we had three different trials, clinical trials to, to trial these various vaccines. Um, and I think it's important to say that, you know, people put their bodies on the line for this. You know, they, we didn't know what the safety was going to be. We didn't know whether this was going to work. We didn't know what side effects uh, would, would be linked to these uh, vaccines. So I think fundamentally from, a, from an ethical point of view in the clinical ethics, um, the people who are involved in those trials and the countries who are involved in those trials, they not only put in their own resources, so we use the WITS resources, we use the, um, the academic resources in our country to run these trials. Um, and again, the leverage that we had at the time was not exercised to ensure that access would follow from that uh, clinical trial. 
Um, and ordinarily that's what happens. So, you know, when we do HIV trials and TB trials, we get access to those um, health technologies. And it seems that the, the pharmaceutical companies in this case um, really did, were not interested um, in engaging in that kind of ethical clinical trial. Um, so I think that that, that uh, perspective is really important. Um, and then also just to add, Kate, um, to, the, to the idea of this massive uh, public investment in vaccine technology, um, it's more like $100 billion um, that's been paid by taxpayers around the world towards these vaccines. Um, and I think what we know, you know, Fatima started out by saying we need to challenge this whole system. And, you know, we agree this massive investment shows that, in fact, you don't need patents to stimulate innovation. One way in which to stimulate innovation is for countries to invest in that science, which in the US that happens all the time. The National Institutes of Health actually did the early scientific work on mRNA technology. So there is a history of public investment in science, but the, the, this just turns around to um, handing over of that knowledge um, that's produced publicly with publicly funded, uh, in publicly funded institutions, and it's just handed over to uh, commercial interests. And those commercial interests then say, well, the only way we can innovate is to have these monopolies. Um, so I think that in the, we need to reflect on the, the need for us to move away from this very notion that patents stimulate innovation. And we have to really push now for alternatives, um, whether it's public investment, whether it's uh, different kinds of royalties that can be paid. We're not saying now these companies should go broke. We're saying there's a way in which you can do this work of producing life-saving medicines without the kind of profiteering that we've seen during COVID, but also during the HIV epidemic um, and generally in public health. Thanks. Great, thank you, Manjana. Just before I get to Mia's question, we have a, um, a great comment coming in from Malise. She says, thank you, Manjana. Worryingly, the AstraZeneca trial participants in South Africa haven't been told whether they were in the placebo or vaccine arm nor have they been offered the vaccines if they were in the placebo arm. The trial started before the J&J one and the third wave might be coming. That's very concerning. So another important ethical issue um, coming up there. And let's not even go into the no liability and compensation issue when we come to, when we come to ethics. Um, so a question from Mia, and this is one perhaps that both Omanyana and Fatima could reflect on. Um, could you recap what the outcome was when the South Africa government, South African government, took on pharmaceutical companies about ARV production and what the complexities were? What can we learn from that? So I think starting from you, Fatima, as you were around then, and then perhaps uh, Omanyana, if you've got extra to add in, please. So Kate is suggesting that I'm old. Um... <laughs> Experience, Fatima. <laughs> Oh, man. So, so thanks, Mia, for a great question. The, the thing is that the government did not take on the pharmaceuticals on ARB production. Um, what happened in the first years of the Mandela presidency was an attempt to pass a law that would make it easier for the entire country and all medicines to have access to generic versions of medicines for parallel importations and compulsory licensing. And unfortunately, Mandela was... Um, uh, was succeeded by Tabo and Becky and, and, and that just, you know, enter an entire AIDS denialism. So it was activists and organizations and groups and, and the very groups that are working on access to vaccines now around the world were working around access to ARVs at that time uh, that basically had to force the hand of the pharmaceutical industry. So, you know, what, uh, we were talking about this in the week, the waiver is a rule-based system. It's within the rules of the WTO. During the HIV AIDS crisis, when we had hundreds of thousands of people getting sick and dying on a daily basis, we had patent defiance. We took on Pfizer and defied their patents. And the irony of, of, of Pfizer now uh, and BioNTech and the German government's um, position is, is sort of not lost on us. And, and the fact that Pfizer demanded 
that the South African government initially put up sovereign assets for the no fault injury scheme and then back down, but it still asked for full indemnification is, you know, is, is, is a bittersweet thing to swallow, right? Which is why we, we're really concerned about the amount of influence that Pfizer exercises. So it was a combination, me, our patent defiance of civil disobedience, and then, you know, basically begging the pharmaceutical industry and our government to act in a way which would actually share the knowledge, share the know-how. It's, it's the very same demands that we're making now to scale up manufacturing so you don't just rely on one supplier and so that you can bring a lot more ARVs into the country uh, at a cheaper price so that it could become more affordable. Um, and this is the thing, you know, when Omanyana was talking about uh, the amount of public investment in Yuan as well, is that even at that time, when we used our laws to basically ask the industry to disclose all of the research and development costs, to say, justify your price, justify the fact that you have a 20-year plus monopoly, because there's also evergreening, justify why you get to have exclusive control and decide who gets supplies, when they get supplies. Currently, the same situation with Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, all of these companies, right? Um, that the companies refuse to share their data. I mean, we only know about the $10 billion at least or more that Umanya has spoken about uh, in terms of public investment and co-funding on the current batch of uh, the front run of vaccines because of filings, because of access to information laws, because of declarations that people have to file. I mean, the industry is not very transparent and willing to share that. Um, so instead of actually disclosing and justifying why they were charging those excessive prices, and remember, Mia, that the only way we were able to scale up production and bring in generic manufacturing competition was because civil society took on the pharmaceutical companies, and they didn't want to make that information available. They didn't want to justify why they were charging those prices, so they settled and they agreed to grant multiple voluntary licenses on terms and conditions that they chose, nevertheless, but they got some royalties out of it as well. But that was how we were able to bring in um, multiple uh, generic supplies of, you know, at least the first line uh, batch of ARVs. Um, there's been some work done afterwards, but I think that after the Mandela government was sued and after government was put on the trade watch list by the Clinton administration um, our, and, and because of HIV AIDS denialism, our government has been scared has deferred to the pharmaceutical industry, which is why we don't have a proper transparent and fair medicine pricing system. There's no price regulation even on Section 21 approvals. Do you know that? So the Section 21 medicines can be authorized and approved, and there's no price regulation or transparency on that. We would have to go to the Competition Commission to try and argue that they have jurisdiction over Section 21 uh, approved medicine. Um, so the issues are a bit more complicated. Uh, and I think that uh, the lessons that we've learned from HIV AIDS, Mia, is that this industry is not interested, I think, in my view, so please don't sue me, in my view, um, in saving lives. It's interested in profit and it's interested in monopolies. And every time we have an epidemic and every time we have a pandemic, then we have to basically be campaigning and protesting and forcing, you know, for people to do the right thing. Um, which is why we were obviously, you know, I'm going to end now, Kate, but when South Africa decided to go with a waiver proposal, we were all in shock because this, this is, you know, was unprecedented, right? But the fact that the South African government would actually try and use the WTO machinery to try and make sure that the entire global South can actually get access to supplies uh, basically in our lifetime. Um, and then just the last point about whether the waiver takes a few weeks or a few months, the point is we still have to keep the pressure because the public health experts are telling us um, that this epidemic is, or this pandemic is going to be with us for a while. It's not a once off vaccination program that we're all going to have to do. We're going to need booster shots. We may have to have annual vaccination programs. So the, the possibility to make a lot of profit for a very long time exists, even with the sharing of the knowledge and, and, and of, uh, of the know-how. And, and, and that is why you've got to invest in uh, production capacity and, and uh, ability. Thanks. Absolutely. And we've already been seeing Pfizer and others make huge profits um, as, as we go along. Um, I, mean, Jana, I don't know, before we go to Johannes's question, if you had something you wanted to just add on to, to Mia and, and HIV uh, crisis yeah. times. Yeah, I'll just make one point, which is that indeed we've had all these fights and battles and we've won some of them and part won some of them, but we cannot 
keep fighting drug by drug, disease area by disease area. Every time there's a new thing, we can't be going to court, which is why the, why the, the change in our law is so fundamentally important. We need to have a legal framework that responds to public health so that we're not having to do this one by one thing. It's, you know, it really takes up the resources of civil society, which, you know, the, the industry is, is quite happy with. Um, to see us fighting these battles on many fronts. But what the, the key thing is to really get our, our legal framework up to scratch, make sure that it's constitutional, make sure that you know, the, the government is actually meeting its constitutional obligations to protect public health. Thanks. Thank you. Johannes, your question, please. Thank you. Thank, can you hear me? I hope. Fatima, I mean, if I understand you right, then you are saying that the wafer um, problematic, it's, it's more long term. I mean, perhaps you can already say, is it kind of um, half a year or is it a year that African countries could really um, start producing? And if it's really a bit uh, longer term, then the question, of course, arises, what, what do we do in the meantime? And wouldn't there be, I mean, that's what Germany says and, and Europe says all the time, um, wouldn't uh, the, the, the voluntary licensing uh, be really um, a way? I mean, J&J uh, did it with South Africa. What, what's the problem with the voluntary um, licensing? Thanks. Kate, do you want me to answer? Okay, so the problem with the voluntary licensing uh, at the moment is that there aren't enough. They're segmenting markets. Uh, they're restricting the geographies of where those supplies can go to. There's very little transparency. Even the WHO Director General has said that the current batch of and a handful, it's only a handful of voluntary licenses, uh, one, are uh, not very transparent, uh, don't actually speak to the public and health and epidemiological needs basically of the world, um, and are basically very self-serving for particular pharmaceutical industries. So Johnson & Johnson gets credit for giving a license to Aspen, but let's, let's unpack that a bit just as an example. It's a fill and finish license. It's not a full manufacturing license, right? Um, initially, all of the suppliers were only for exports to the global north. After pressure from us here in South African civil society, they agreed, they didn't disclose even the initial amount that Johnson & Johnson was meant to manufacture. It, it soon turned out that it was between 200 and 300 million dosages. We now know that it potentially could be 400 million. The initial agreement was that none of those dosages would even stay in South Africa. Now there's an agreement that between 20 and 30 million could actually stay in South Africa and the rest will go to the African Union. All right. So there's an issue around um, the Serum Institute, for example, agreement with AstraZeneca as well. It restricted the number of markets it could go to, restricted the number of countries. Um, it wasn't basically a, a license that was given to multiple manufacturers. So the question then is, why does Johnson & Johnson only give one fill and finish to John? Um, to, to Aspen. Um, when the US put pressure on it, it gave a license to Merck. The, the, when we talked about the untapped production capacity and the untapped manufacturing <clears throat> capacity that the WHO is also identifying, you see, this is where these companies could be granting multiple voluntary licenses. And it links to Mia's question earlier about the HIV AIDS situation, where government would only negotiate for Aspen to get a license as the preferred provider. And we always said that you need multiple suppliers and multiple manufacturers, because even amongst generic manufacturers, there needs to be competition. Even generic manufacturers, you know, are interested in profit in markets. Um, the AstraZeneca's uh, conduct around uh, voluntary licenses, we and you know, MSF can speak to this as well, is also limited globally. It's a handful of licenses. It's certainly not enough. Uh, you know, Johannes, we need to make billions of dosages. The current situation, even with a handful of voluntary licenses that some of these companies have given with very restricted terms, you know, is not actually going to meet the production targets that we need and the demands that we need. Um, and, and the reason, you know, the last reason, Kate, why you need multiple manufacturers is 
this week and last week, we saw the implications of if you only have, uh, if you have very tight control of who can produce the vaccine, you have a contamination problem in the US, it affects the entire supply chain of Johnson & Johnson, and that has basically delayed our Johnson & Johnson rollout. So had you had 10, 15, potentially more manufacturers doing the Johnson & Johnson batches, you would, you would definitely be in a different situation. The impact on the supply chain and the entire production uh, scale, if there's one, one plant only that is allowed to make that uh, particular vaccine is, is an issue. And the Serum Institute, you know, and somebody will write up that story, is the perfect example and illustration of that. Because if they're the only ones that have the license and they have to serve 40 countries where the UK is a preferred customer and trumps those 40 countries, so supplies had to be diverted to the UK when the UK had a supply crisis on the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, and then you had two problems where India, Indian government basically imposed a partial export ban, but the US government imposed an export ban as well, so that means serum couldn't get the raw materials, right? And so this is why you've got to basically, you know, what we said in the beginning, you've got to open the field. Uh, in terms of getting as many manufacturers as possible. Um, and yes, Johannes, you know, it would be great if they would give more multiple uh, voluntary licenses while the negotiations take place, because the worrying thing in the US statement is she does say, uh, the representative does say that this could take a lot of time because it's so complex. And, and that is the reason why civil society is saying that we're very worried that the negotiations will drag on and we don't want what happened with the Dawn declaration to happen here and then also that it could be watered down. Thanks. And just to chip in there as well, Johannes, you asked about what can be done in the meantime. Um, MSF and others have also been calling that countries that have been hoarding doses and have excess doses are able to share those doses. So that is something potentially in the short term while we're seeing such a discrepancy um, vaccine um, administering around the world, you know, that could be happening while these negotiations are ongoing. Um, you and I don't know if you had anything to add there as well about voluntary measures and perhaps also not just looking at voluntary licenses, but the limitations of um, mechanisms we've seen so far, such as CTAP and whether or not those have worked. Perhaps you could tell people a little bit about what that is and um, if it's been successful. Yeah, I, th I think Fatima has a very uh, good summary of the limitation of voluntary license. And, and even, um, even, I mean, CTAP is basically, as we know, the WHO uh, initiative under the Solidarity Call for Action and saying that, okay, in pandemic, encourage all of the companies come forward, openly share the, the technology or know-how, IP data in the global pool so that it could be probably licensed out or generally it's not totally clear uh, yet but uh, uh, the idea is to see instead of a one by one because we just not, not what company do and they claim everything as what uh, want to license or transfer but as Fatima said if we look uh, closer it's very very limited but the CTAP was trying to see uh, instead of doing one-to-one -one, why don't we have a global mechanism that's more open the problem is that uh, company have, especially the multinationals, immediately rejected it. And some company like Pfizer also uh, consider CTAP initiative as dangerous, damaging. <laughs> Although if we see, okay, as a kind of second opt optimal option before we get a waiver, which will empower a different uh, narrative, compulsory li uh, voluntary license can be used differently. If CTAP was used and supported to its uh, to meet its uh, objective, it could be something you know helpful. But the problem is that nobody can afford to see. I'm going to openly share this through WHO, which with will probably bring a little bit more trust and uh, transparency. Other than uh, for the moment, civil society globally was trying to get what exactly going on with very limited outcome because company kept everything as confidential and then they claim they are doing a lot but if we close uh, closer to look it is not totally uh, not sufficient at all thank you Yuan. um i think quite a few people nathan have tried to take a stab already at your question of of how long a successful outcome will take um perhaps i'm just gonna 
narrow that down just as a reminder and then I think we should probably go into closing comments. Yuan, just to pick up what you were saying earlier as well about the process over the next couple of weeks and just to remind everyone that this doesn't, you know, the negotiations still need to occur and, and they themselves are going to take time and we, we're not even sure if we're going to have um, be able to go ahead with negotiations, negotiations at the next meeting um, in early June. Um, so perhaps just in terms of any idea and analysis of the negotiations themselves in terms of time frame you are coming from you and then um, if you could please um, give your final comments and then I'll go to the other two panelists. Okay, uh, thanks a lot Kate and also I just saw a new question coming in in the chat uh, maybe very very nice to think to what to we can uh, conclude. Uh, for the moment as, as we said earlier it's uh, still um, it's, it's, it's tricky because what South Africa and India uh, are asking together with many other developing countries is not only about vaccine. So we, we, of course now vaccines probably urgently um, needed, but we see shortage of diagnostic testing, shortage of there's basically no, not enough uh, effective treatment, even some of the treatment with limited efficacy are in shortage of supply. So it's the, the original proposal from South Africa and, and India was very visionary and uh, very inclusive. So from our perspective, we hope that should be kept and, and then uh, maybe civil society, we, we can discuss with others. I mean, from MSF perspective, we would continue try to ask for the full waiver as originally proposed as a scope because otherwise it doesn't make sense, especially uh, it, it makes sense, but it doesn't make the full sense, especially when we see for vaccines, you need uh, a little bit longer time and other steps to support depend on the technology and so on. But for therapeutics and for diagnostics, there probably will be much quicker impact if the waiver was adapted. And then it's also not just about the product itself. It's also about raw materials. It's about uh, associated technology. It's about the use because the, the firms do come, they apply for patent and uh, claim IP on every single step. So all of this need to be lifted in order to free the, the capacity uh, globally. So that is what we were hoping for in the coming uh, stage of the push and also the negotiation. Um, and what's need to be done and also what's next step was really, uh, we're, still, we're still in the stage of gathering intel uh, because up to the early next this week, what we heard was a proponent led by South Africa and India were prepared uh, to present the revision, revision text around or after uh, mid-May. So for further discussion, but um, for the moment, we don't know whether that schedule would be accelerated with uh, the statement. So that is from the proponent side, but from the uh, opposing country side, we still need other countries such as uh, now Germany and Switzerland clearly said they are not going to follow, but they hold <laughs> power. They also need to come to the negotiation table to say, okay, now we have to look at the text stop talking about ideology, looking at the text and find a solution. So that still need to happen. In order to reach that, um, as Fatima and Omeyan mentioned, the pressure has to be kept from civil society part because it's not over. It is a new stage of the new fight. So hopefully we know the civil society network in Europe and the US are meeting, uh, I think today and in coming few days, to update the strategy because you know still European countries would have to come on board. Yeah. And just to echo what Joanna said, we saw a huge civil society push in the United States. It would be good to see that in other countries. So a number of organizations, um, former political leaders, etc., were, were writing letters to the Biden administration. So it would be really great to see that happen in other countries that are opposing the waiver. Um, Closing comments, please, from you, Omanyana. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for the great questions and discussion. Um, I would say that the, the US coming out with this statement in support of the waiver is massive. Um, and it will show a trickle down effect on other countries. We saw New Zealand come out almost immediately in support of the waiver and France um, also came out to, to support the waiver. 
Um, and the, the world is looking to the US and to the European Union for leadership on this. Um, this is coming initially from developing countries. And so I think there's a bit of a colonial mentality in terms of going ahead to support developing countries and, and their needs. Um, so I think that the coverage that um, the South African media needs to focus on is the kind of the global nature of this campaign. Um, the fact that there's a need for a constant debunking of the pharmaceutical industry's talking points. We've heard many of them on this call. Um, and there is, uh, you know, the, the, the talking points that they have are the same old ones that we, we heard during the AIDS um, epidemic. You know, it's like there's no capacity. Um, one of the, the CEOs of Big Pharma said, oh, I don't have engineers to, to send, you know, to do tech transfer. I mean, really, let's get real and let's get serious about all of the different mechanisms that can be supported uh, and getting more people on board to understand the complexities. We understand that these are complex issues, but fundamentally, this is about saving lives um, and saving our livelihoods as well, because economies across Africa and across the world have been de devastated. Um, we've seen, you know, increases in child hunger um, during the lockdown, and that really has to be able to turn around, and we can only do that once we have mass vaccination programs around the world. Thanks. Thanks, Omanyana. Um, Fatima, some, some last words. Um, so three last reflections. The one is, you know, more than a year into this pandemic, we still don't know what our opposition parties think about medicines, patents, and intellectual property. And I think um, we need to probe them a bit more because they are the elected opposition. They're sitting in parliament and they potentially could have a significant role on passing the patent amendment bill. I think it's just disingenuous to talk about, well, we shouldn't have another lockdown. We should open up the economy. Government is not securing enough supplies of vaccines without addressing the role of the pharmaceutical industry in our own politics in South Africa. So do they fund these parties? What's going on? Why are they so silent about them? To me, is, is quite remarkable. Um, the second is that we're going to have to, as civil society and the media, uh, really, really follow the negotiations and keep the pressure up on the South African and Indian governments, because we are worried that in order to have a negotiated tax, that they will water it down so much that they will agree to whatever the US and the EU wants and only limit the waiver to the vaccines and come up with a very narrow uh, waiver resolution. So we are really calling on the South African and Indian governments to continue doing what you did from October 2020. Don't relent, don't give up and don't give in uh, because this is important, not just for South Africa, but for the entire global South. Um, and the third thing is we call on all the pharmaceutical companies to unblind the clinical trials. If we are good enough to contribute to scientific knowledge in South Africa and we participated in five trials, two of which we are actually going to be using as part of our vaccine rollout. Uh, at least four of them have emergency use authorizations in other parts of the world, being administered in other parts of the world, in richer parts of the world. At least the least you could do is unblind the clinical trial so that all of the participants know whether they got a placebo or not and make sure that you guarantee post-trial clinical access. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fatima, and thank you to all the panelists today for sharing your insights. I'd also like to say a big thank you to Doctors Without Borders, MSF's comms team, who really rallied at the last minute after we got this announcement late on Wednesday night. And to all of you who came here today, the fact that we had over 40 journalists participating when you were only um, told about this yesterday afternoon, we really appreciate you arriving. Um, and just to let everyone know as well, just to have a look at the chat box for anyone who has follow-up questions, um, Angela's details um, are there for you to contact. We'll also be sharing a recording of this webinar. And um, we really just encourage all of you um, as members of the media, please to you know carry on covering this issue. Um, I know that TRIPS is something that's quite technical, but it's definitely something um, that more and more people are, are beginning to understand and the, the patents issue generally, not just internationally, as Omanyana's brought up, it's really important that we have pressure and um, Fatima's alluded to, 
um, on what's happening with the bill here in South Africa. So please carry on doing the fantastic work that you've been doing on that. Um, we all know in South Africa that we could not do without our press. Um, the advocacy role that they play, the transparency role, um, and uh, most of the issues that we have with regards to accountability are, are really a question of the hard work done by, by civil society and the fourth estate with the press, and less to do with the role of our opposition um, MPs. So thank you very much, everyone, for participating, and uh, we hope you have a great end of your week. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, MSF. Bye. Are we are we staying on to? We can stay on for a quick few minutes if everyone, if you have time, Johan. I don't know if we've lost a manana already. Malise can stay on, and Bori. Kate, you're mute. Again, I'm just going to try to get Omanyana back. Sure. So I think there's just uh, SABC, Khadija, and Sue need to wait for them. Okay, Omanyana is coming back now. Um, I'm already getting a message. Oh, sorry, Barry, I interrupted you there. Um, yeah, so uh, just to mention that, uh, so this is still recording. So if you want to share the recording, okay. you know, maybe what we can do is... Uh, yeah, um, stop the recording. Yeah, exactly. So exit and then exit in, in a minute or so. Oh, we should exit and come back. It's not possible just yeah. to stop the recording. Um, I'm not sure whether you can do it on your side because you're logged in as an admin. Um, I think maybe it's, try that. I think, it's, yeah. There's still, um, sorry, there's still SABC on here, and I'm not sure who's, if Sue is from the media or. Hmm. Maybe with her um, administrative powers, Kate can. Uh, um... I'm trying right now to say goodbye. Okay. Or we can, mm -hmm. uh, or, or we can rejoin. Yeah, but they might still be there. I'm just not. I'm just not quite sure how to. Just give me a second.